Um, I just want to welcome you all one more time to Preventing Violence in Our Homes, Meeting This Moment with Care and Justice. Sorry, Meeting This Moment with Connection, Care and Justice. Prevent Connect is a national project for the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault sponsored by the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The views and information provided in this web conference do not necessarily represent the official views of the U.S. government, CDC, or CalCASA. And we're so happy to be able to bring you this web conference today um, with our partners at Prevention Institute. Um, so with that, I want to introduce you to um, the Prevention Institute team, Alicia Sonji, Abina Sayer, and Lisa Fujia Parks. Um, Alicia, Vina, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us again. It's um, always a pleasure to be able to um, share space with you all. So I'll pass it over to you, Alicia. Thanks, Ashley. Hi, everyone. This is Alicia, and um, I'll let my colleagues also introduce themselves. We have Abina, who is helping out with uh, our slides today and has been critical to the planning. So I'll let Abina introduce yourself next. Hi everyone, this is Abina, happy to be joining today. And I'd also like my other colleague, uh, Lisa Parks, to also introduce yourself. Hi everyone, this is Lisa. Hi Alicia, hi Abina, hi everyone. And I see hi, we- Lisa, do you wanna continue on? Sure, and I see we color coordinated today. It's a teal day. <laughs> True. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I, um, we wanted to start the conversation off with, with some acknowledgments and uh, just a brief moment of silence. Um, there's obviously a lot going on and we know that um, many people are uh, facing lots of challenges, struggling, grieving various losses. And so, you know, we, we don't take it lightly that you've chosen to spend an hour and a half um, with us today with, within this community. And um, we just wanted to acknowledge um, kind of the magnitude of what we're facing personally and within our families and communities and the, and the whole entire planet, really. Um, so just want to take a moment to encourage you to connect with your breath and just, you know, take in that nourishing oxygen and, and um, let's hold this moment and all the families and communities that we care for um, kindly in our hearts. Thank you so much. And um, as is shown on the slide here, we're also just extending our thank you to all the people who perform um, these essential services listed here and, and others who aren't listed here, um, who we are all supported by. Um, so thank you so much. So thinking about our session more today, uh, we wanted to start off by sharing our objectives. And what you'll notice is that this session is really meant to be solutions and creativity focused and really recognizing that our families and communities have inherent assets, powers, and solutions. We probably won't be able to answer all of your questions uh, in this hour and 30 minutes, but we hope that it can spark, spark ideas and actions for moving forward. So please continue to use the text chat as you've already started. Um, so that you can join in on the conversation. And we're gonna kick off another uh, text chat question right now. So on the next slide you'll see here, um, we'd love to just hear from you. What's top of mind um, for you when you're thinking about this moment and the work that you're doing? So please use that text chat to share and we're, we'll come back to it to see what themes are coming up. So this graphic here and paper from the Center for Global Development unpacks pathways between the pandemic and violence against women and children. We can see things like economic insecurity or social isolation are a couple of the pathways uh, that are discussed and uh, helps us kind of understand how 
uh, the current situation contributes to uh, some forms of violence. So, for example, close quarters, especially those that are tied to stressful conditions, are linked to stress, fear, and poor mental health, which can in turn increase the likelihood of violence against women and children. If you're interested in reading the full paper and learning about the different pathways, some of them are also outside of the home. Uh, you can definitely take a look at that. Uh, we will be sharing a full resource list at the end as well, so you can always come back to that. Um, and we just wanted to share this as uh, a way to start to illustrate how the impacts of the current climate relate to violence in the home. Um, and this slide um, references an article from a publication called The Conversation, and we appreciated that it highlighted how structural and social and political factors are shaped by gender norms. Uh, gender norms influence behaviors like hygiene and social connectedness. They influence um, underlying health conditions the kinds of political solutions that are pursued and, and more. So we appreciated this uh, gender lens to understanding COVID-19 and uh, much of the situation that we're facing right now. We also know that power and control is a big issue uh, when it comes to violence in the home. And we're in a moment when many people are losing a sense of power and control so this is something we'll want to pay attention to as we seek solutions. We also wanted to elevate the importance of a racial justice perspective um, when looking at preventing violence in the home and supporting families during the pandemic. We know that structural racism and other forms of structural oppression have created inequitable community conditions and opportunities and are really root causes of our public health and safety problems. We know that black, brown and indigenous communities are being hit hard by the virus, as well as other conditions that can increase the risk for violence. And so we're really holding and advocating for racial justice policies and solutions. We also wanted to highlight this resource from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the technical packages to address child maltreatment, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and, and ACEs are all very good. We've lifted out a couple of strategies here that we think these are evidence-based strategies that we think are relevant to this moment with adaptations for um, some of the practices that we're implementing for safety right now. So our web conference title today talks about connection, care, and justice, which we believe are critical to preventing the many forms of violence in the home, whether it's child abuse, intimate partner violence, suicide, gun violence, et cetera. Um, connection really represents social cohesion and connection um, really as a protective factor for for um, preventing violence and being supportive of safety. Care represents meeting immediate needs that can help decrease family stressors and support safety at home. And justice is about advocacy, policy, and systems change for health equity and racial justice, which are needed right now um, in this time of crisis, but also in the long term, in the long run, and really building that infrastructure. Uh, within these different buckets, we've been seeing some different emerging actions from the communities that we're working with at Prevention Institute and our different partners. We actually released a blog post yesterday, uh, which we uh, recommend you check out. It speaks to multiple forms of violence inside and out of the home. But some of the things that we talk about in there are identifying and advocating for emerging needs, whether it's at the individual level um, person by person, but also at the policy and systems level. Um, we've also seen actions in terms of supporting healthy relationships during stay-at-home orders. People really getting creative about maintaining and strengthening social connections, which we'll be exploring much more today. Uh, a lot of partners have been sharing messages of hope, resilience, and self-care, whether it's over social media or even people sending letters and notes to neighbors. 
Uh, another big theme is definitely confronting racism and xenophobia as public health issues, uh, as we see who is most affected by COVID um, and uh, the inequities in that. And then the last one is around making the case for gun safety. Um, there's been a lot of media coverage on uh, increased uh, gun purchases and ammunition purchases. And uh, we've seen certain locales consider gun shops as essential businesses. And so there's really a need around gun safety um, as well. So going back to the text chat, um, and then we'll come to our guest instructors uh, for the day. But uh, what I was seeing here, and I've been speaking, so I haven't been able to follow it too closely, so I'll ask my colleagues as well. Um, but I saw people kind of talk about uh, what's coming up for them personally and in their communities. So whether it's uh, as an individual figuring out work-life balance or navigating childcare uh, during this time, and, I, and more at the community level, um, I've been seeing a lot of concern about children and youth coming up in the text chat. Um, but uh, Ashley, Tori, Lisa, what would you like to add? Yeah, Lisa, um, I saw those as well. And some of the other things that I was noticing um, was a real acknowledgement um, that, you know, communities' needs may be, may have shifted. Um, and so, you know, some conversation about how do we acknowledge that and then also help build the connection to what people actually need right now. Um, that was something that I noticed um, that, um, that a lot of, and then, uh, of course, the concern about people being at home um, who, you know, are not safe and, and how do we outreach to those folks. Thanks for sharing, Ashley. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to continue diving deeper into this and really talk more about solutions uh, with our guests today. Um, so speaking of our guests, uh, just wanted to, since we have uh, more than usual, it's really exciting uh, that we have six different guests. Uh, we have Aristea and Hillary from uh, McKinley Family Resource Center, uh, which is in Humboldt County, California. Uh, they're going to be speaking to uh, rapid assessment and work to address immediate needs as a family resource center. We have Jerry from the National Compositors Network who will be discussing engaging men and boys and uh, also women and all genders through culturally rooted practice. Uh, Renee is going to be sharing about some work uh, through, the, through Vital Village in Boston, uh, which is a place-based community engagement place-based community engagement work that's focused on children, families, and communities well-being. Megan from Ujima will be talking about work to prevent violence against uh, women in the Black community through federal policy. And then we'll be ending off with Vicki from the Hogg Foundation, who will share a regional mental health funder perspective um, on the current climate uh, from work that uh, the Hogg Foundation does in Texas. So Lisa, I'll hand it off to you to introduce our first guest. Great, yeah, we have a lot of different um, perspectives and contributions represented here. And I'm really thrilled to uh, introduce and bring into the conversation Aristea and Hillary, who are with the McKinleyville Family Resource Center, um, folks who I deeply admire and who I get to work with through a project called Safety Through Connection that we are all a part of. And so when California issued a stay at home order, um, you know, we were able to connect with you um, to learn about what you're doing and kind of um, be in thought partners in how to approach this. So we're excited to have you share about that. But first, uh, could you tell folks who are on the conversation today just a little bit about what the McKinleyville Family Resource Center is? Yeah, sure. Um, the center at McKinleyville in Humboldt County is a one-stop location for services and information and activities for community members. It was created to address the disparities in access to health and social services in rural and tribal communities. Um, the center is trying to cultivate inclusion and trust among community members and center partners 
increase healthy relationship skills, strengthen community beliefs and, and that support safe relationships and mitigate the impacts of poverty and housing insecurity and initiate change within multiple systems in our community. Um, so quite a holistic approach that you take in McKinleyville. Yeah. So we um, connected shortly after the stay at home order was issued in California to learn about um, what was coming up for you and what you were doing. So can you tell folks what were some of the first things that you did as this uh, statewide shelter at home order came down? Yeah, so the first thing that we did, it was the Monday before the statewide shelter in place. Um, we reorganized the staff and how we were, um, we were giving services. So five of our seven staff um, went to remote work that Monday. And two of us completely changed what we were doing to meet the current need. Our AmeriCorps members and social work interns also went to remote work um, at some point during that week. And uh, we suspended our volunteer program. A lot of our volunteers are in vulnerable populations. Um, and then we had, uh, so we were the, one of the first agencies in the county to have uh, county workers reassigned to us for the disaster response. So we have three county workers uh, that are working with us full time now. The other thing that we did was to mobilize our reserves and so we put money uh, to respond immediately to the emerging needs uh, that we were hearing from people on that first day. Right, um, and you know, to, to kind of organize all those needs that we were hearing, um, we realized it was gonna be more effective if we created kind of one central location to hear those things. So we created a, a really short, simple survey for people. Um, it essentially gets at who are you, what do you need, how quickly do you need it? Um, and we've been sending that out through our partners. We've been putting it on social media and just trying to find as many ways to, to reach people so we can understand the, the depth of the crisis in our community. Um, and really the goal of that, you know, if you think back to the slide that talks about um, connection and care and justice, we're trying to use care as a way to build deeper connections and work toward justice as this crisis goes on. Wow. Um, it's impressive how quickly you were able to mobilize changing the kinds of work people were doing, how they were doing their work, bringing new employees into your organization. I'm so happy to hear that you have reserves that could support that nimble, resilient um, shift to meet what was going on so quickly. And I love that you conducted this survey to find out uh, from people directly what they needed. So what did you learn from the survey and um, other ways that you connected with folks in your community? And what are you doing as a result of what you're learning? We're, we're hearing kind of two primary themes in, in our, our surveys. Um, one theme is around material needs. There are a lot of people who um, are short on bills. They don't have enough food. Uh, they can't find cleaning supplies, even if they have the funds for them. Um, and so there's, there's kind of this angle that we're approaching um, and using those reserves to meet those immediate needs. Um, the other thing that we're hearing a lot about is the challenge of having children in your home 24 hours a day. Um, and a lot of people feel like there's this really big expectation for, for what they need to do. Um, and so we've just kind of been trying to let people know that this is an unusual time and there's teachers are going to teach the arithmetic and the writing and all of that once we get back to whatever normal is going to look like um, right now it's all about social emotional health and um, connections with kids uh, so really just trying to release the pressure valve for people mm. yeah and uh, so go ahead I was just going to say, and, and, you know, we've also been trying to figure out the science of outreach right now. Um, and it's, it's kind of hit or miss in terms of what works, but the most effective thing we found is sending the survey out through our partners, um, through a trusted partner of individuals in the community. 
And we've been trying to um, meet the needs that people are self-identifying for themselves. So it's been things like food from our food pantry, um, propane for heat or firewood, we've bought gasoline, um, money for laundry, uh, and cleaning supplies, hand soap. And the reason that we are responding as much as we can with exactly what it is people are asking for is because we believe that people are the experts in their own lives. And that's always how we do our work. And in this time, um, people are really anxious. And it, if when we are able to follow people's lead, it gives people a sense of agency in a time that feels really out of control. Mm -hmm. That seems really important. And I think we have a text chat where we wanted to ask folks um, what aspects and needs are coming up in your community. Um, I think it's really valuable to look at both the assets and the needs. So you mentioned, Aristea, that your trusted partners and their ability to connect with community members is an asset in your community. And um, people's agency is an asset in the community. So you're lifting up both those assets and those needs and being responsive, which, as you said, gives people... Uh, helps with the anxiety, helps people feel that they're part of the solution and part of um, having some control uh, in what's happening. So that's, that's really great. And um, look forward to hearing what others are sharing about what's coming up in their communities as well. So uh, Hillary, you mentioned, you know, the importance of sense of agency, building trust, by be meeting people's needs. How do you see what you're doing right now connecting to supporting families and preventing violence specifically in the home? Um, I'll jump in here. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the, the, as the way we see it, um, there are these major stressors for a lot of families, um, which food, housing, school, income are all being impacted right now. And so f for us, our, our goal is to really alleviate those pressures as much as we can um, or connect people to others that can support them. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a, a pretty extreme way to reduce the risk of violence in the home. Um, and we also want to strengthen trust and connection. Uh, as a protective factor and, and to reduce the risk of violence so that people who have come to us for, let's say, diapers and wipes, um, maybe the next time they come to us, they also feel comfortable asking us for help with um, a potential violent situation in the home, um, or we can send them resources through that connection. Um, and we also want to build this foundation for, for really long-term work with people. Uh, we don't want to um, just hand out some Clorox wipes and say, good luck. You know, we, we really want to um, start a relationship with people so that, you know, even once this situation is over, if, if an individual family is having a crisis, they have somewhere to go. Hmm. That's really wonderful. And I um, just appreciate how you're really um, addressing what's coming up for people, I, I, you know, there's, this is a moment of a lot of trauma for a lot of people and to, res, you know, to be able to respond with connection and care um, in the ways that you're doing, um, I can really see how um, that is so trust building, so helpful, so holistic, you know, as you said, um, a, a connection and a trust to build on for a range of issues that might come up in the family context. So really appreciate what you're doing. Um, I, you know, in our conversation, I remember hearing, okay, this week, number one is food. You know, next week we're gonna deal with children and the fact that schools are closed and the week after that, it's gonna be housing. And then after, you know, <laughs> and so um, I, I'm feeling that as well, that this, you know, there are phases and stages to this and we're sort of, in the moment and we're also looking ahead and anticipating um, what we might need to be preparing for. So what are your thoughts about that? And um, do you have a sense of things that you might focus on as you go forward? Uh, the thing that 
came really clear to me is how important it is that uh, our nonprofit be uh, stable and ready to respond nimbly. And I think uh, sometimes there is a belief that nonprofits need to be scrappy and that means like not, uh, not prepared in this way. And so I think it, it would be nice for us to, to look at our beliefs about nonprofits and um, and and rethink that. Mm. Mm. Um, and then you know, for me, in in any venue I have the chance to engage right now, I am trying to prepare people for the idea that normal wasn't working for everyone in our society, and um, we have an opportunity now to create something that is a lot more focused on wellness and um, a, a holistic people-centered approach. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to rally more people to, to my side with that. And um, I, I have high hopes. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for sharing um, and for doing what you're doing in your communities. And we'll circle back to you a little bit later in the conversation to hear more of your thoughts. Um, but thank you so much. And we're going to bring in our next guest speaker, Jerry Teo with the National Compadres Network. Um, Jerry, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're, do, did we want to report back on assets and needs? Sorry about that. This is Alicia. And I think that I'll just give a quick summary of it that uh, when it comes to assets, something that a lot of groups were, or a lot of people were mentioning in the chat was, uh, the collaboration and coordination among community agencies. And that's really important and sounds like that really required those relationships and connections ahead of time. And so thinking about the long term, um, it's really important to be coordinating and collaborating um, across agencies and with the community. That's great. Thank you, Alicia. That really resonates for me. Um, and what you were, what Hillary and Ariste were saying that, you know, these, our society in many ways was not working well um, or equitably for so many people, including our community-based organizations that were um, struggling to, you know, address so many needs with, with inadequate resources. And so the ability to coordinate and work together across nonprofits, across government and community um, to be able to bring our assets together. Um, and then, as you said, Aristea, uh, make sure that that continues and continues to transform the way that we do work in a people-centered way. Um, so I'm glad to hear that that is an asset that's resonating for other people as well. All right. Well, thank you. And um, now we'll bring in our next guest, our uh, Jerry Teo with the National Competitors Network. And um, Jerry, you and your organization have been, you know, just, I've admired you and your work for many years now, and you've had a positive impact on a lot of the work at Prevention Institute. So I'm thrilled that you are able to share with us today. And um, for those uh, folks who are with us today who may not be familiar with your organization and its work for over 30 years now, can you tell us a little bit about the network and what you do? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, let me just uh, first of all uh, say uh, good morning or good afternoon to everyone and blessings to everyone. I want to uh, just acknowledge you know, all of people that are here with us and and uh, your people, your ancestors, your communities. And, and uh, I wanna give thanks to my relatives and uh, my mom, dad, uh, great grandparents and ancestors who have prepared me for this moment. You know, uh, the work that we do is really a, a, a legacy of all of that. And, and you know, um, my work began in, I mean, professionally in the early seventies where we were doing a lot of work on the ground and, and working in, in areas of, uh, of community, which meant you dealt with all of that, but but with a focus uh, then, you know, the, on uh, dealing with domestic violence and sexual assault, I was one of the, I was actually the first male hired at the East LA Rape Hotline. Mm. Uh, so began, and that was in the the uh, early 80s. And and in seeing, you know, a lot of this, uh, the the pain that was going on in families, um, and and the, the domestic violence, the sexual assault, the uh, child abuse. And us men that were working in the field, especially us Latino men that were working, 
we were very distressed because a lot of the harm was being caused by men and men that looked like us. So it caused a, you know, kind of a, a shame, a, a disconnect. And, and so we decided we needed to do something. And, and myself and Dr. Ricardo Carrillo decided to call men together because we felt we needed to take a role and a call out to men that wanted to do something, develop programs that were culturally based. And 19 men came together. As we gathered in, in our cultural way, we, we, you know, we said a prayer, called to the ancestors and asked, asked them to guide us. And let me just say, you need to be careful when you do that because uh, they'll bring some enlightenment to you. Mm -hmm. And as we began introducing ourselves, what we realized, even though we wanted to develop programs and wanted to do good things in the community, the major thing that came up for all of us is that we were all wounded, that we carried generational trauma, that we carried some colonization, that we carried uh, some, some, some aspects in us that we needed to heal before we went out and did work with anybody. So we felt the most revolutionary thing we could do is, is to begin healing ourselves, to take responsibility, to begin reclaiming the sacredness of our manhood and, and to recover that, to discover that again, and then to begin recultivating and decolonizing at the same time from some of these wounded ways. And that, that was the impetus of the National Compathers Network. We've, uh, obviously a 501c3, we've been along, uh, around for more than 30 years doing work with, uh, with men and boys in communities, but also recognizing that, you know, that women and girls and all the gender spectrum were part of that. And so uh, in, in that process of those 30 years began um, being guided really by the women and inviting a whole group of women that were really guiding us from the beginning, but we just formally uh, integrated them. And so we have a very strong women and girls effort as well. But uh, we are an, a national organization that does uh, work on healing, on dealing with trauma, generational trauma from a cultural base. So we're trauma-informed, healing-centered, but culturally based. And, um, and we do training, capacity building, technical assistance, but a lot of healing work across communities. And that's what we're getting called to do a lot now. And um, based in California, but have networks all across uh, the nation in 40 different states. And, uh, We've trained thousands and thousands of people and provide support for everything from school districts to mental health professionals to community workers to working with domestic violence, sexual assault, fatherhood, teen fatherhood, motherhood, and, and uh, LGBTQ issues as well. So that's a little about who we are. Mm. Mm. Wow. I just, it brings me so much joy to think about the healing work um, that you've brought to thousands of people and that they're bringing to communities in 40 states. What a beautiful network you have woven um, over these years. So I imagine you are hearing from folks within your network and also seeing things in your own community. What, what kinds of things um, are you seeing and how are folks starting to respond? Well, I, you know, I think, um... What, what happens in times like this is that, um, you know, things that are very deep in us become triggered. And so those things that, that um, have been wounds that we've been able to, you know, and it's funny because we, we cover them by, by being, staying busy. We stay busy, we stay active, we're doing a lot of the work. Uh, the, us, you know, service providers do and do and do and give and give. And so we don't have time to think and to feel. And a lot of times, even though we're telling our people working with, you need to heal, you need to deal with these things, but we're not doing them. And, and when things begin to get quiet and, and things where you have to go home, and I mean home literally, but also home in terms of your sacred spiritual home, that, that spirit inside of you, things begin to, to crop up. And, uh, and, you know, quickly within our staff, we had to, to reground ourselves and offer a space for the staff that we work with, first of all, to, uh, to express themselves and to have an open channel for, uh, we had to, to um, kind of reorient a, a process by which we connected because even though we're doing social distancing, it doesn't mean we need to disconnect. And we needed to, to really um, um, call on those, if you will, those emotional spiritual connections that our grandmothers taught us about. Uh, we needed to, to feed our, if you will, our spiritual sense of, of recognizing that when you send energy or send uh, prayers or you, or you send good blessings out to people, they can reach them. Uh, there's, there's no way I can do a Zoom meditation, which I'm now doing, which I thought I'd never do, uh, without that belief, with understanding that, that energy and spirit can be communicated, you know, and they always have been. It's just that now we're able to see people. And so we had to enlist and be creative. Uh, 
uh, with our networks. And fortunately, we've trained, you know, uh, thousands of people all across the country in how to hold space and how to, how to engage people in, in different uh, uh, ways. And so they are connected in, way, in way, different ways and we're able to reach out to them and begin providing support, first of all, for them individually, but also begin then sharing messages. So we have a very strong social media uh, platform that we use. Uh, we created some, some messages around healing and regrounding yourself, around caring for children, and, and also around men and boys. You know, right now, um, you know, a lot of the wounds that, that men uh, who have recovered, if you will, um, are now cropping up again. You know, and and it's, it, it seems like simple things, but, but we use things to occupy ourselves. And for men, there's no sports on. And, and, you know, and, and that a lot of times occupies space and calm spirit and, and now what do you do with that? You're in close, close, close proximity to those people that you love, but when we tell men when they're feeling anxious or you're getting angry, you know, take off, leave. Well, you can't do that. You know, you can't leave the space. And so some of these, these things that, that they're normally doing and with young people who are, um, who are, you know, are struggling and a lot of times don't trust the system and don't trust the messages. You know, they're saying, ah, this is, you know, BS, forget it. And, and so we're tr struggling with how to communicate to young people. You know, they're, as, as they're on the corner smoking some weed and they're passing a blunt, you know, or they're, they're, they're passing a, a drag. Well, you know, so, you know, so all of these things are different challenges now that, that, that we're facing, uh, but we are creating messages and creating processes by which, um, we can address some of this trauma that has always been there. The inequity has always been there. It's just that it's showing up, you know, a, a lot more uh, vividly. And what we need to prepare now for is not only what's going on now, but um, we're getting calls from communities who have lost loved ones and lost relatives. And, and how do you help people grieve uh, virtually? How do you help people grieve, uh, uh, you know, without being there at the graveside? And, but the other thing that we're, we work a lot with schools and with mental health practitioners, we are now gearing up when kids go back to school, whenever that is, that's in September. You know, how do we support teachers and, and schools? Because now, uh, besides the, 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 the issues that, that the communities of color and disenfranchised communities have faced before, now we add on another layer of what we call susto or post-traumatic uh, fear. How do you deal with that and still promote learning? So those are some of the things that we're struggling with. I'll, I'll mention one other thing. My wife, who you know, is a healer herself, and and the whole, you know, the Comadres Network and all the women that are working in this have shared with us. I um, mean, they're busy. They're busy uh, all the time because women in the network are are texting them all the time, and they're texting them because they they can't uh, call because their partners are there or their children are there, so they have no privacy. So then the best privacy they have is going in the bathroom sometimes. So what they do is text. So the women here are doing a lot of text counseling, a lot of text grieving, a lot of text healing, you know, and so we're having to shift at how we uh, provide support to one another and build this interconnected family. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing, Jerry. And again, it just, um... I just think that the network that you've built, those relationships with the folks that you are, that are part of the network and all the people that are connected to those people, I imagine that connection and that care is so helpful. Um, and you know, that, you know, people are really different, but being in those kinds of sacred relationships, as you say, you know, um, I imagine just is so helpful with helping people find their way through their own healing and a path forward that's helpful for their for themselves and their families and their communities. So, and I too believe that uh, we can connect um, through even with physical distances um, to to our ancestors, to the people who are here with us now and and beyond. So, thank you so much for sharing all of that, and we will circle back to you as well, um, and we'll transition now to our next guest. Thank you. So up next, we have uh, Dr. Renee Boynton Jarrett, the founding director at Vital Village in Boston. Um, so Renee, I'd love for you to uh, share a little bit about what Vital Village is and what's really been coming up in your community. 
Thank you so much. I just want to share that I'm honored to be here and invited and I have found the conversation thus far very nourishing and rejuvenating for me. So just want to thank um, my co hosts and thank um, the invitation and really appreciate that so many people are making time for this today. Um, it's incredibly important. Important. So Vital Village is a network. We are organized to be a network, very much focused on social connections. Um, we work towards maximizing child, family, and community well-being, and we do that by really focusing on key capacity building Asset aspects within communities. How do we build the capacity of community residents um, to um, progress along leadership trajectories to be acknowledged and given a platform for being the true change agents and solutions generators within their community? And how do we build the capacity of local institutions that serve the community to partner intentionally with parents, caregivers, and and neighbors. Um, so we really focus on those two primary strategies. And all of our work really does focus on social networks and connections on one level or another. So in response to COVID-19 and the request for physical distancing and the extent to which COVID-19 has really exacerbated many of the existing systemic inequities, we've really seen things happening on three levels. One, we've seen families and civically engaged community members immediately move into responsiveness with compassion and concern for their neighbors and um, really extending themselves to see what they could do to make a difference and to stay connected and to support each other. Um, we have seen that as being an antidote to fear and an antidote to isolation, the actual action of really um, uh, connecting socially and working as a more collect connected beloved community. Um, for staff and service providers, we've seen that, you know, we've had infrastructural gaps in our public health infrastructure and our service infrastructure, and there really was inadequate preparation for this type of scenario and really an adequate set of relationships with community members such that they can be at the table as policies and decisions are being made on their behalf around education, healthcare access, um, um, and um, healthcare um, decisions um, around, um, around who receives care. <laughs> um, and then we've seen institutions as well with that have had inadequate infrastructure for how to engage the input and wisdom of community members at the table in deciding what the institutional and policy response um, to um, in this crisis should be. Um, and so all of these have implications um, for equity. So we see a high level of capacity at the level of community and lower levels of capacity at the level of institutions, systems, and um, kind of uh, organizational structures to be accepting of and partnering with communities. Wow, I really like how you broke that down across three different levels to really share how, what's coming up. So as you're thinking about what's happening, um, what kind of actions are you taking in response to all this to support the communities that you're working with? So like others here today, we've we've transitioned from what has been a lot of in-person um, intentional relationship building and trust building into a virtual space. And that has been a learning curve for us. We definitely have not been perfect with it, but we have held that space and committed to that space. So our, our actions are really driven by community input and community participation and design. So we like to call it a co-design model, but it has 
how can we build the capacity of community serving institutions and organizations to be responsive to community member input at this time to really consider how they are designing with communities for this response instead of on behalf of community members. We've also really worked in our kind of leadership development model to really build capacity for community members to break through the barriers of technology um, in order to convene and hold space um, that is their own. We've really focused a lot on messaging. So there is a pretty dominant narrative that was tracking out for a while around COVID-19 being an equalizer, um, that this is an infectious, contagious illness that you know shows that we're all in the same boat. And we actually really know now that it's actually magnifying inequities in, in a massive exponential way because of the existing historical systemic structural racism and inequality that had not been adequately addressed before. So it really exacerbates all of the fragility of the existing systems um, and inequities within those systems. So um, we are really working on telling a counter narrative around the power and importance of community um, for a time like this where we actually don't have very simple medical solutions. Um, we actually don't know all of the information from a virology perspective or immunology perspective and we have insufficient healthcare resources and we have an insufficient public health infrastructure but what we do have an abundance of is members of the community that have care and compassion for each other um, and the ability to heal in connection so the exact theme of our conversation today so how do we really think carefully about language. So instead of, you know, social distance, physical distance with a widened circle of regard, widened circle of compassion and expanded circle of connections, really empowering every member of the community to be a change agent at this time um, because our existing infrastructure has significant limitations. Um, um, so a lot of our work right now has been really um, setting up community members to be civically engaged and active through warm lines, through through hosting and holding virtual spaces and how that can be done safely um, and effectively and how technology can be not a barrier to that. And I'll have to say it's a learning curve. We've had several weeks of very safe virtual meetings and just this morning we had a perpetrator enter our Zoom meeting. And so it does happen even with the best laid intentions and we are still learning, um, but we are not going to allow um, um, uh, perpetrators to interrupt or disrupt our important need for social connection. So having spaces like this to again reflect on, yeah, as Jerry was saying, like the larger trajectory of the ancestors whose shoulders we're standing on in this moment is really what we need to rise above and continue to think creatively about new solutions. That's amazing. And I love how you've been able to do things like have a wellness ideas bank or virtual playground and breastfeeding support groups. And I know when we talked earlier, we, we also talked about what about people who don't have internet access. And so I'm wondering if maybe you can share one or two things really quickly. I want to make sure we can get to our next speaker. But, um, you know, what are some ways that you're uh, connecting offline? It's so great because our village is full of people of multiple generations. So there are notes, there are handwritten notes happening, pen pal ideas happening, pictures and images that are being shared. Um, people are doing very low tech things on social media, like a Facebook roll call just a way to really be inclusive of everyone. But taking the moment to um, drive by a neighbor car side by side, allow the kids to see each other from each other's car. Um, so maintaining the appropriate physical distance, but supporting each other. So if a parent has to run in for groceries, neighbor can sit in the neighboring car and kind of watch over their children. So we're maintaining 
the appropriate safety, but we're supporting each other and we're thinking creatively about breaking down barriers. So knowing that just considering and empathetic listening to another person means so much in a time like this. I love that creativity. Thank you for sharing. And uh, we'll circle back with you at the end as well. Um, so next, I'd like to uh, introduce our guest, Megan Simmons, who is a senior policy attorney at Ujima. Um, so Megan, can you share a little bit about Ujima and how the pandemic is affecting communities that you're working with? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, like you said, my name is Megan Simmons, and I'm a policy, the senior policy attorney at Ujima, Inc. We are the National Center on Violence Against Women in the Black Community. Um, Ujima is a project of the DC Coalition on Domestic Violence, and we are a culturally specific organization. Um, just for clarity, that means that we do recognize that, of course, Black people are not a monolith. So we're cognizant when we are sharing culturally specific items and recommendations, trainings, education, and the like that we're, you know, that we know that there's, you know, the Afro-Latinx community, the African immigrant community, and of course, the African American community, and those communities do have some differences. So we just make sure that we acknowledge that. Um, some of the things that we have kind of seen, or the way that the, these communities have been um, affected by COVID-19 are, um, like many or many folks on this call have probably seen in the news with um you know just the high percentages of african americans and black people um contracting the disease and excuse me the virus and dying uh and possibly dying some of that has been linked to pre-existing conditions that affect the black community um it's just been amplified is being amplified even more with this particular um, vir virus. Um, things uh, like uh, the previous co-facilitator was saying, you know, um, some of the lack of access and historical um, and systematic racism that we um, have seen that has gone unaddressed again, has uh, reared its head <clears throat> when it comes to what we have seen uh, in, these, in this particular community as it relates to this virus. Right, and we've definitely been seeing a lot more uh, news coverage on the impact uh, the past week or so, and I really hope that helps move us towards actually addressing these inequities long term, really thinking about health and safety through a racial justice lens. I'm hopeful um, as too. A Paul, oh. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm I was just going to. Oh. Sorry, I, yeah. I think we're at a delay. <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted That's to okay, um, bring up one other concern that sometimes I think escapes the, the media. Um, because of the um, increase in housing costs that many cities have seen, you have more people um, cohabitating or living with, fam you know, multi-generational families that are living together, these, you know, and you, which means that you have more traffic in and out of the houses. Um, many times these people are, folks are um, first line workers or essential workers, you know, people that work at grocery stores, people that work, um, you know, in medical facilities in some type of capacity, again, increasing, um, you know, the, the possibility of um, getting contracting the virus. Right, and when living uh, cross generations, thinking about the seniors in those homes as well. And yeah. Right, and the and 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 again, even the outside of being a senior, folks in um, within that household already having other pre-existing um, right. conditions like asthma and high blood pressure. You know, even some of these folks who one would not necessarily consider to be senior, but still having some of these pre-existing conditions. True. So as a policy attorney, um, how has your work been shifting during this time and how have you been able to support your communities that you work with? So a lot of my work is face to face. So it has um, definitely made me um, a lot more dependent on technology since we are socially distancing, um, reaching out to uh, people on um, the Hill and uh, 
<clears throat> reviewing policy closely just to see how it's going to affect some of the communities that sometimes are not represented. Um, for instance, you know, as it relates to the CARES Act, um, initially, you know, as it relates specifically to the checks, when it was initially rolled out, it was going to be a direct deposit, it was going to be based on, um, you know, tax returns. Uh, there was a concern that some people, you know, if they get Social Security or, or the like, sometimes they're not required to, re to do tax returns, what that looks like and how they're going to be able to access those funds if they don't have a banking account or even if, you know, they did file taxes, but they just didn't do direct deposit. Some people are, you know, don't have banking accounts or, you know, still actually get paid via check and they go to cash, cash checking places or maybe a local grocery store to access the funds. So making sure people are aware of that, um, getting the information out there, making sure that um, the communities know, you know, what kind of alternatives are out there in the event that, um, you know, that did not happen now. You know, it has since occurred that, you know, there are going to be paper checks that are going to be issued, but just acknowledging that that could be a barrier to folks receiving these very much needed funds. Um, asking if there's anything that we can do to assist um, those those um, partners and strategic partners that we've made um, here in the area and other um, organizations that are doing work. Uh, is also another way that we've been trying to con contribute and again listening and also listening in on these numerous <laughs> zoom calls and facetime chats and town hall virtual town halls and the like and seeing how folks are using technology to educate folks making sure they get the the, the right information um and making sure that uh we have good information on folks that are knowledgeable scientists and medical personnel that can give us accurate information to ensure that we can move forward. Right. So I know that you were talking about, you know, things like making sure people can get the checks and that sort of thing. And uh, wondering if you could help, you know, really uh, make those connections for folks on the line today of like, why are these types of actions important for preventing violence? And why is it particularly important uh, for women in the black community? So we've seen through studies that any kind of economic insecurity will increase the likelihood of violence. Um, as you can see, you know, um, black mothers are often the breadwinners in their their families. And when you have um, numerous folks losing jobs um, that whole families are dependent upon, we want to make sure that people um, know what resources are out there so they don't have to so they can at least stabilize their homes as quickly as possible with the resources that are available to them. Um, oftentimes these women are working in wages. I mean, we, we, many of us are aware of the gap, um, the wage gap specifically as it relates to black women. And so we just want to make sure that folks know that even in a situation where, um, you know, they already have a, even in situations where in those weight, they have lost those funds that already have a gap. Um, we want to make sure that those homes can be in a better financial state as quickly as possible with these resources um, that are available to, to folks as quickly as possible. Definitely. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing, Megan. Um, we'll again also circle back to you at the end. Um, but now I want to uh, turn over to our final guest for today, um, Vicki Coffey from the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health. Uh, the foundation is, a, is Texas based and focuses on transforming mental health through community. And Prevention Institute, where I work, is very fortunate to be working with hog on an initiative called Communities of Care, which is focused on mental well-being of children, youth, and families in the greater Houston area. So thank you, Vicki, for joining us. And just want to know what's been top of mind for you um, in your role as a funder um, during this pandemic. Yes, good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to be a participant on this call. And of course, I was looking at my puppies in the background going, don't move, I'm about to start talking. And of course, they want to start moving around. So I apologize for that. Top of mind for us as funders is just um, really joining some of our other uh, partners that are funders and foundations 
and looking at how we can be supportive during this time and ways that we can uh, shift some of the way the business as usual processes that we've used to be more flexible. And so just being available as a funder. That's great. And, um, you know, a lot of folks on the line today are probably more in the uh, grantee uh, side of things. And so just wondering your thoughts on how you think grantees should, should approach their funders in conversations about shifting deliverables and actions uh, to meet the current situation. Sure. So again, I mentioned earlier that we really are looking at trying to be more flexible and just more responsive um, and available. And so the first thing that I would recommend, well, as a funder, we really recommend proactively communicating with your grantees and people that you partnered with prior to this uh, recent crisis so that one, they're aware that we're still there, we're still available, and that um, just to reassure them that funding is stable, and if it's not, sharing with them what the status of that is, but um, just mostly maintaining open lines of communication with your funder, reaching out to them, um, and just chatting with them about what's going on with you, specifically either through email or a phone call, and let them know what you've been doing at this time to support your population of focus during these times. It's very important. It's also real important, I'm going to speak kind of from the funder and the, and the grantee lens. Um, it's important that you're very transparent and that you share very openly what your challenges are. And as a funder, it's important for us to create a space so that um, our grantees feel that they can come to us, that we are not going to be judgmental and that we're not going to say, oh my gosh, they're not stable, so let's cut their funding off or anything like that. But just to create the space that we're more in a, in a partnership and that we want to be available to be able to be flexible and support whatever your needs are. And it's important as a grantee that you take some time before talking to the funder and think about what is it that you need specifically during this time, whether it's internal or infra infrastructure type support or even specific activities that some people have mentioned on the call earlier today, like buying diapers or helping with food or just different things like that but understanding and being mindful of what your needs are before you approach the funder so that you go in um, with an idea of what it is the ask is going to be for your, for your potential partners. Thanks, Vicki. And I know that uh, you've signed on to uh, a greater uh, call to action for philanthropy. So I'd love for you to share about that. Sure. So the Council of Foundations has um, really reached out to leaders in philanthropy um, with the lens of wanting to make sure that we are being uh, responsive during this time and just making sure that we're able to act and move quickly and provide people with the support that they need. And so they just have some guidelines that they've provided for funders to look at um, and making sure that we are all again being supportive of our grantees and of the people that we work with and, and of our communities. So some of those things look like things that I mentioned before, like being flexible and being responsive and, and flexible even allowing people to shift funds and use them in ways that maybe they originally hadn't asked to use them um, so that they can be more responsive to the needs of their community. Also being flexible and allowing them to um, shift their timelines because we know that this everyone's timelines are all confused and messed up now, and that um, they may need to shift their grant reporting times or shift when their um, payments in rushing and getting payments out a little sooner than we might have. So then just being open to uh, listening to what the needs are. So that Council of Foundations um, pledge, several philanthrop philanthropic organizations are signing on to that to make a commitment to hold ourselves accountable to the people that we're responsible for supporting. That's amazing. And I can see um, on the site that 660 organizations have signed on to it. So it's great to see uh, philanthropy really wanting to step up and support uh, nonprofits and groups that they're working with during this time. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Vicki, for uh, joining us and sharing. Uh, I want to bring back all of our uh, guests for uh, kind of a coming together right now. And uh, Lisa, I'll let you start us off here.
Lisa, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. So, um, you know, it's so wonderful to have speakers who represent different types of work and contributions and pieces of this puzzle. And we really liked this graphic of different roles in a social change ecosystem. It was developed by Deepa, Deepa Iyer with the Solidarity Is and the Building Movement Project. And it kind of shows different roles that we can play all in pursuit of equity, shared liberation, inclusion, inclusion and justice, whether it be within our organizations, our networks, our neighborhoods, our communities and our movements. So, you know, really in this spirit, we recognize that folks who are participating today are all contributing in different ways. And um, we hope that, um, that this conversation will help us all reflect on ways that we contribute and, you know, things that we can offer and also things that we might need from, from other folks who are part of um, this work as well. So we see Prevent Connect um, to have a real opportunity here and um, we want to kind of think about what we can do collectively as all of us here today and just part of the, the greater movement. Um, so on the next slide here, you know, we really want to know um, how can we be helping each other out? How can we support each other's work? And what could our collective call to action be? What can we really uh, advocate for together, do together. Um, so want to encourage you to uh, share in the text chat any thoughts that you have. And while you're writing, uh, we'd also like to turn it back to our guests from today and ask a similar question of, you know, what do you want to ask of others that are on this call right now? And what should our collective action um, really be? And Jerry, if you want to start us off. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, well, I, I think, you know, one of the things that we've found is that, you know, self-care and self-healing. Uh, this is really brought up, I think, for all of us, even as practitioners and those people that are doing the work, that we need to uh, you know, care for ourselves and care for our families as well. And, and I, you know, for foundations, it's really important for foundations really to uh, support uh, self-care for practitioners and, and those service providers. Uh, and, and at the same time, you know, that we include healing uh, as part of everything we do. You know, a lot of us do advocacy and social advocacy and social justice work, but there needs to be a percentage of our time and even our budget that is focused at healing and, and dealing with generational trauma and the social inequities that are now very prevalent and, and evident. So that's what I would um, call to. I would I'll also like to, you know, ask um, people on the line if there's anything that you um, think that we can do, uh, especially in reference to men and boys, uh, uh, you know, to pre please reach out to us and offer us more suggestions. We've been doing this a lot of years, but we, we still need to develop, uh, you know, stronger networks of being able to, to heal men, but hold men accountable too, and, and to lift them up in a way in which they can, uh, men and boys uh, can really be more uh, supportive and responsive and, and so we can break the generational cycles of, of violence and oppression. Very important message. Thank you, Jerry, for uh, sharing that, sharing your wisdom with us. Um, Aristea and Hillary. What I've been thinking about is um, safety for workers and um, because the difference between this disaster and what we might have expected up here, like a tsunami or earthquake, people who are providing the disaster assistance are possibly at risk. And so the things that I'm thinking, if you're in a position to be making decisions about these things, uh, to think that it sh should probably not be the lowest paid people who are at the highest risk. And then um, because we were able to test out our system for responding to what would happen if somebody showed up uh, to our site yesterday saying that they thought that they might have the virus. Um, the thing that is really sitting for me is uh, that it's important for us to stay inside of our scope. And because the systems don't really know how to do this yet, we're making it up as we go. My role is to advocate um, that we not have to do things that are outside of what we're supposed to be doing. 
Um, and then, you know, for me, I, I would just add that um, we've also found that as people are seeing inequities for the first time and they're seeing that uh, the system needs some work, uh, there are a lot of helpers who are emerging and, and trying to jump in and create things. Um, and so my, my plea to everyone is that you help those helpers get connected into organizations that are already doing work in the community that might not have been seen before so that um, the energy can go kind of directly to action instead of into the, the, the drudgery of creating systems. Thank you both. Yeah, I like the idea of not trying to duplicate work, but really feed in where there's already uh, good things happening and uplifting those. Uh, Renee, what would you like to share about a, you know, how others can support you and what our collective actions could be? I I so appreciate what's been what's been shared by um, my colleagues here on the call today, and I think that. This is a moment where there are really fundamental decisions that could be made about how we do things differently. Um, it's a crucible moment in many ways to experience this degree of fear, this degree of ambiguity, this degree of uncertainty, and to see the, the massive cost of failing to act against systemic inequities and structural um, factors, like of waiting for the accident, waiting for it to get worse and worse. Um, and we could, I think the data is overwhelming because it's very hard to see people when you see percentages, but I think this is really a moment to see humanity and if we could work together to tell the story, to make sure the frame is on our shared humanity and our shared collective, you know, community, we could actually have an opportunity to create much more robust, responsive, compassionate, equitable systems. So we could really rebuild something very, very different. But I think it really does require being able to see humanity and not look away from humanity. Um, and that's really difficult when you're seeing a lot of numbers and a lot of information. Mm -hmm. So how can we do differently? maybe not be the perpetrators of more numbers and information, but really tell the story of humanity and collective solutions that could guide new policies and structures and practices that really do build on the things that we've discussed today, you know. Right. Yeah. I, what you said, I wrote it down because it really resonated with me that um, it's hard to see people when you're seeing percentages and really thinking about the humanity. That's really powerful. Uh, and it looks like in the text chat, others are also agreeing. Please, I see lots of great things coming up in the text chat and we're going to revisit it uh, very shortly. So please continue sharing ideas there. And uh, I think Vicki wants to share something as well. You go sure. next, Vicki. Sure, I just wanted to add that as a funder, we have the opportunity now and always, but especially now, to ensure that we are centering our work and our efforts to make sure that we're supporting the inclusion of voices that have been most impacted by this crisis and that we should really prioritize equity and making sure that vulnerable populations and communities during this pandemic have the opportunity to have a voice and have input about what they need and what's helpful at this time. That certainly aligns with our mission, our vision, and our values. Mm -hmm. And lastly, we want to use our leverage as a funder and our position to influence um, and provide information to our legislators about what the needs are and how we should at, at this time really support individuals and communities who have not been included or have not been prioritized for so long and have experienced huge health disparities. 
Totally agree. And uh, I think I saw that as part of the pledge uh, that you were talking about earlier. So it sounds like a lot of funders are trying to uh, try to move in that direction and think about how to better support equity in their work. Thanks, Vicky. Uh, do any of our other speakers want to share anything right now? Sure. I just think there's like, uh, I just had like two. This is Megan. Um, and they're, they're similar responses. Just making sure that we know this, sometimes the solution to some of these um, problems that we are encountering are not a one size fits all for all communities. Um, here in, I'm, I live in DC, you know, many of the students did not have access to internet at all. And if they did have access, some of them only had access via their telephones. So just making sure that um, when we're talking to folks and sharing ideas that, that we are coming up with um, or sharing solutions that are practical. Um, I have, <clears throat> for example, I have a friend that teaches in a rural community. They decided to go to worksheets and set up scheduling times. And I did put this in the chat, scheduling times for students and families to come out so that they're still socially distancing, but the, the folks are still getting the information that they need um, academically. Um, and then sh and sh making sure that we're giving folks, again, practical options or thoughts or different things that they can do if they don't have, um, again, some of these technological resources or monetary resources. You know, a lot of people have gone to things like Instacart and DoorDash and all these different things, but some families just don't have that. And so um, maybe someone in the family perhaps will have to drop off you know, groceries to grandma's house. And, um, you know, I've, I've talked to folks that have said that, you know, with, <clears throat> with these stay, um, stay orders and stay in place orders, um, folks have been stopped by police officers. You're just making sure that folks know, hey, you know, some people are, you know, 80 years old, they don't leave their home, they can't get out, or it's not safe for them to get out because they have a lot of, they're a very vulnerable population. Perhaps someone is their caretaker and has to drop things off to their homes so just lifting up those kinds of things and just making sure that people are aware that we don't all have the same um conditions really if i could Thank share uh, i i, I would just uh, i would just like to mention uh to make sure those populations that have not been considered or left out there are immigrant population and a lot of farm workers uh are incarcerated men and women and youth uh, that are equally as vulnerable, uh, and those that uh, you know don't have a voice. Uh, I think you know now is a time that we recognize that we're all interconnected. By traditional language, we call it inkloke nawake, interconnected sacredness. That uh, you know, I think the universe is communicating to us that we need to recognize the interconnected humanity. It's not only humanity, but how we're connected to the earth, to the sun, to the water, to all of those things. You know, when I go outside now. Those birds are singing strong. Man. The grass looks greener. The, the sky looks bluer. I mean, the universe is communicating something to us, and it is that we have been disconnected. And so I think, uh, you know, reach to those that grandmother's message that say, uh, there's a blessing in everything, and, and this too shall pass. So I just want to offer that as a counsel that uh, I was given in, in Compton, where I grew up, by those grandmas. Thanks for those words, Jerry. And uh, yeah, what you were saying about farm workers and immigrant populations definitely is resonating. One of our partners actually uh, just wrote an op-ed earlier this week about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on undocumented women um, and making the connections to domestic violence prevention. So I've shared that in the chat and they'll end up going on the resource list as well. So definitely take a look at that. Um, Lisa, I just wanted to see if uh, there's any themes that you'd like to elevate from the text chat or Ashley before we move into our resources. Um, yeah, there's been um, some really beautiful, inspiring chatting going on, and I hope folks will get a chance to look at it um, maybe after the web conference if you haven't yet, but um, lifting up the voices of community members um, as solutions and assets. Um, thinking about um, issues around inclusion. Um, I think a lot of what the speakers 
have been saying had been really resonating with participants. And so um, I'm seeing echoes of that in the text chat, people offering their own examples and their own takes on some of those themes. Great, thank you, Lisa. And we do want to put one other text chat question out here because we know this isn't the end of these sorts of dialogues. So just want to ask in what ways you'd like to continue these sorts of conversations. And um, one other one that I wanted to lift up from the text chat was just people starting to get creative about ideas like thinking about um, something that someone wrote in the chat about uh, sports and how sports aren't happening right now and how can we maybe think about uh, supporting healthy relationships through video games and other platforms that are being increased in usage. And so that kind of made me think back to the uh, technical packages from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and thinking about some of the strategies in there, like engaging men and boys and coaching boys into men and thinking about, well, maybe those types of models can be, um, you know, implemented in different ways. Um, whether it's through video games or, you know, so lots of creativity uh, among all of us and hope we can continue these sorts of dialogues. Um, and we will be writing up a uh, profile based on what was shared today. So also wanted to mention that. So just to share a couple of resources, um, again, you're going to get the, the resource list that will hopefully be helpful. We don't want to overwhelm you too much. Um, but we wanted to share some things from Prevent IPV and from Futures Without Violence, which are more focused on gender-based violence and uh, have very comprehensive lists there. And then on our next slide here, um, you know, lots of resources also coming up about protecting children, uh, like this one from End Violence Against Children. And uh, they actually have a link from the WHO in there on parenting, and there's these different uh, one-pager fact sheets that are in that have been translated into a bunch of languages. So that's really uh, a good resource too. Next slide. Um, Stop it now. Actually joined us for our web conference on Tuesday and was talking about safety planning. So there's lots on. Uh, supporting safety plans for children and the prevention of child sexual abuse. And yeah, lots of other items too. Um, for time's sake, won't uh, get into all of these, but I will let Lisa close us out uh, with a quote. And thank you once again for everyone for your time and your attention and your contributions. Thank you to our special guests. Um, I wanted to end with this quote, which is a modification of something I've seen um, from 350.org, which is an environmental justice organization, but I've seen this kind of call from many different um, organizations and movements. Um, this is a time to be decisive in saving lives and preventing violence and bold in charting a path to a genuinely healthier, safer, and more equitable future through a just recovery. And um, I think uh, there have just been so many beautiful themes in our conversation today about centering humanity, our interdependence, equity, as we um, act boldly both in the short term and in the long term. So. Thank you all so very much once again, and all our best wishes to you. And look forward to being more connection. Thank you so much, Lisa and Alicia and all of our guests. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, as we said, we will make um, all of the links that we shared available. Um, I don't know if you can see my video, but since it's Friday, here's my pet. He's a pig, and he's been very interested in this conversation as well. Um, but we will be making all of the links available, and as soon as we have that ready for you, um, as well as with a recording, we'll send an email out. So thank you all so much for joining us, and um, appreciate all that you've shared. Um, we will see you on a future Prevent Connect web conference, I hope. Take care, everyone.